today is Stir Up Sunday, the first Sunday of Advent. Welcome to the Oshawa Museum, where we're going to make a plum pudding today. in advance because it needs to be soaked in brandy for up to four weeks, which coincidentally is the same amount of time as Advent. Advent is the spiritual start of the Christian Christmas season. There are many other symbols of Advent, including wreaths, candles, and calendars, but our favorite is the plum pudding. It's called plum pudding, but really there aren't any plums in it. Sometime in the 17th century, the word plum came to mean any dried fruit. So really, we should call this dry fruit pudding. The recipe today comes from our newspaper, the Oshawa Vindicator, and I saved this recipe from Mrs. Wegstaff from last January in 1860. The ingredients are very basic and are things that every Victorian would have in their home. And they include one pound of sultana raisins, one pound of currants, one pound of suet finely chopped, one pound of flour, one pound of breadcrumbs, a little pounded spice, we use allspice, one ounce of lemon, orange, or citron peel, one nutmeg grated, a quarter pound of sugar, eight eggs, well beaten, half a pint of milk, and one bottle of good quality brandy. You'll also need one large pot, a circular cookie cutter or a trivet, a wooden spoon, one pair of scissors and a good set of kitchen scales, cheesecloth, and possibly a pudding mold if you wish. Mrs. Wegseth must have been serving a lot of people when she made this recipe. It makes two large puddings or four small puddings, but today we're going to cut that down by three quarters and just make a little bit of what Mrs. Wagstaff did. All of our ingredients are pre-weighed out. We've used our kitchen scales and I'm just going to add all of the dry ingredients together first. And I like to mix them together after each one has been added. So we've got our sultana raisins, currants, let a mix. A little bit of suet, which is animal fat. This one makes it a little bit easier to keep everything together. We've got some allspice, bread crumbs, and this helps bind it together too. Flour. Of course, you might need to go down to the mill to get your own flour and a little bit of fruit peel. This gives it some flavor. And finally, some sugar. And there's all of our dry ingredients. Okay. The last thing we're gonna add is nutmeg. So I have a whole nutmeg here. This sits in the little pocket and the spikes push down to hold it in place and we'll turn it around to grind it and then the powder that goes into the mixture is the spice which gives the pudding the good flavor just like that now it's time for us to add in the wet ingredients so i'm going to add in milk And then you can just discard the shells into your midden after. Two eggs, and we'll give this a good stir. And then the last thing we're going to add in is our brandy. So again, make sure it's good quality brandy. And we pour it in, and then this is what's going to soak into the mixture. And uh, that's going to give it the alcohol that it needs to be set on fire on Christmas morning. 
here's where we're going to take a break from adding the main ingredients and incorporate some extra ingredients. So the Victorians were very superstitious and part of the excitement along with seeing the pudding and flame on Christmas morning was seeing if you would receive one of these things in your piece of Christmas pudding. We have a penny, a ring, a button, and a thimble. And these represented all sorts of different things. So if you pulled out the penny in your piece of the pudding, it's thought that you would come into money within the coming year. The ring, you can imagine that it's thought that you would get married within the coming year. The button represents the bachelor's button, which came out in the 18th and 19th centuries and was a button that you uh, didn't have to sew on. So bachelors most likely did not know how to sew. We have that. So they would remain single for the rest of their lives, it said. And finally, a thimble, a sewing thimble, is similar but just for the ladies. So um, if you receive the thimble in your piece of pudding, then you would become a spinster. So you would be lonely and stay at home um, sewing and spinning yarn for the rest of your life. So we mix these in and everyone would get a turn to stir the Christmas pudding and make a wish. So the next thing that we're going to do is put our pudding in a mold. So I'm going to take a good chunk of cheesecloth and just line our mold with it. And that helps keep the shape of the pudding. And I'm going to pour it out into the mold with all of our extra ingredients. There we go. Okay, and now what you want to do is we will just bring this all together and give it a good uh, twist at the top. Okay, make sure that stays all in together. And then we're going to take our cookie cutter and just place it at the bottom of a pot. So the bottom of our pudding mold doesn't touch the bottom of the mold and scorch the pudding. So at this point, you want to boil the water on a high heat for a few hours, and you wanna tie a string around your finger as a reminder to check the water levels because the water evaporates very quickly. So I'm going to put a lid on this, and we'll come back and see when it's finished. The pudding gets stored in a cool, dark place in a container that allows more brandy to be poured over top and soaked into the pudding. The alcohol won't let any of the ingredients spoil. Each week, we check on the pudding and add more brandy. This really helps the flavors blend and eases the task of setting the pudding aflame just before dessert on Christmas Day. On Christmas Day, as the meal is being eaten, I'll boil the pudding again to warm it up. Turning out the pudding from its mold or unwrapping the cheesecloth is always nerve-wracking. Even for someone as capable as Mrs. Cratchit from Mr. Dickens' Tale of Christmas Carol. I will pour more brandy over top, add a sprig of holly, and we're ready to set the pudding afire. 